right. Well, good morning. Welcome to day two um, of our Authority of Scripture week. Um, hopefully you were able to be here yesterday and um, just some wonderful, wonderful wisdom uh, from the Old Testament of how do we think through some of these kinds of issues that we face. And um, as I mentioned yesterday in the introduction to the week, uh, that we are spending um, some time this week in Authority of Scripture, as we do every year, thinking about um, important issues related to the interpretation and application of the text. It's one of our core values here at CIU and um, something that we live out, uh, hopefully day to day in our lives. Um, but we take some time each year to have um, a dedicated series of chapels uh, here to this particular uh, concern of how do we live this out in our lives? How do we live under Scripture's authority? And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we um, talked a bit back in the fall uh, as we were kind of finalizing our plans for um, this uh, series this week and really felt in light of um, some of the things that we've experienced as a community that it would be good for us to have some time just to think on how Scripture speaks to us um, on issues related to the difficult things that we face in life. And um, just even recently here, we had no idea that, um, that as we sit here today that we'd be experiencing another loss and... Um, just even um, from hearing with uh, some emails as well as just some, some contact from both current and former students of losses that have been experienced even in these last few days, um, that life can be challenging. And if Scripture speaks to the issues related to our salvation, and we listen to what it says about the work of God in Christ, um, it also is important for us to look at how Scripture addresses us as we walk through these kinds of things here in life. And so yesterday we heard from some of our Old Testament faculty and some of the insights that we see um, from the Old Testament. And again, if you were not here, able to be here yesterday, I don't know if it's up yet on the chapel archive, but I highly recommend um, listening to uh, hear the discussion yesterday. And then today we're going to be looking at some insights from the New Testament. And we are formatting this a little bit differently than um, how we often do Authority of Scripture Week, where we have kind of a lecture series or series of chapel speakers individually each, each day, um, and doing kind of more of a kind of family discussion kind of format, a conversation together about this. And so we're going to um, talk a little bit more about New Testament. Then tomorrow is a day of prayer and um, give us some opportunity to pray together for each other as a community. Uh, but during the chapel hour tomorrow, uh, we're going to hear from some of our counseling and psychology faculty and looking at what are some practical ways, some practical wisdom as we walk through these kinds of issues of how we can um, put these things into practice in our lives and care for each other in the body of Christ and to do so in a way that hopefully um, helps point us toward um, here the healing that God offers us um, here in Christ. Does that mean that we're the impractical guys? I don't know. So I, don't, yeah. I guess I suppose it could be, yeah. So, uh, but uh, today I am joined by two of my New Testament colleagues that uh, apparently we all got the memo of wearing blue jackets today. So, um, so I guess, uh, yeah, it's just the thing with the New Testament studies, I suppose. But... Um, uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, those that are up here with me today. So, and if I don't know you, my name is Mike Naylor. I teach New Testament at the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and uh, joining me today are um, two of our seminary faculty that teach in the area of New Testament. Um, Dr. David Croto is the Dean of the Seminary and School of Counseling. So glad to have you here. And then Dr. Marcus Clausley, a professor of New Testament. Um, and uh, he and I tag team Greek courses here at CIU. So. Um, and it has been a privilege getting to know these guys. Um, you both came in 2013, so been over a decade now here at CIU, serving and ministering amongst our students and equipping um, here um, us to study and, um, and to apply Scripture well. And so we're going to take a look at a few different passages um, from the New Testament. And yesterday's kind of motif um, of being in the wilderness, um, I think, was very helpful in thinking through some of those kinds of concerns. And as we come to the New Testament, um, we have the promised arrival of Messiah Jesus, even if we just sang in this last song of what God has accomplished in Christ and these long promises um, that even found their roots back in the garden when things went astray for the human race as, as Adam uh, rebelled and uh, we find sin and death entering the world of God, even there providing glimpses of the redemption that was to come, that now as we come to the New Testament, we have the coming of Christ that he has come, he has lived, he has um, experienced life here on earth, suffered the things that we suffer, experienced the things that we, we suffer, and was able through his death to provide um, here salvation for us. But then what does that mean for us as we continue to live life? And in some ways, we kind of find ourselves still in a wilderness. Um, I don't know if I'm stealing any thunder from you, Dr. Clausley, later on here, but finding ourselves as 
sojourners, as pilgrims, as aliens, to, uh, to go a little First Peter here, um, uh, within this world, that while we have this great salvation in Christ, we recognize that we are still on this journey, still walking through in many ways the wilderness of this fallen age and seeking to follow after uh, uh, this Messiah Jesus who has paved the way for us, the author and pioneer of our faith, as it says in Hebrews, and yet we face suffering. And the first passage that we're going to look at um, uh, here today is um, just a favorite passage of mine as it deals with this issue of suffering here in Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to start rather broad uh, with our uh, consideration of some insights from the New Testament. And then we're going to take a look at a couple more kind of specific examples of how God works through um, and is present with us in the midst of suffering. Uh, But Romans chapter 8 falls at this incredible portion in the book of Romans where Paul has been building all the blessings that we have received in Christ um, and has talked about just even the first part of this chapter, how we've been transferred as a result um, of what Christ has done from being under condemnation to now there being no condemnation in Christ from the authority of the flesh to now the domain, the rule of the spirit of life within us, that we have gone from being um, here foreigners and separated that way from God to being reconciled, not as those that are slaves within the household, but very adopted as sons and daughters, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And then he says here, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And Paul is, is very real about the experiences, very authentic about the experiences that we're going to face. And we'll, we'll actually take a look at some, uh, another um, section of one of Paul's letters here. But this passage now, as we take a look at Romans chapter 8, um, that Paul says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed for, um, here to us. And um, if we only took verse 18 in isolation, we might draw the conclusion um, that way that Paul essentially is saying, buck up, things are going to get better. And while in a regard that is true, and we're going to come back to this at the end of our time together in chapel, that there is a glorious future that awaits us. We found ourselves living in the present, the now, as we face suffering. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on this first section, but Paul talks about how creation longs to see this um, future glory revealed that we share in, and creation longs for that as well, crying out, um, I hear groaning in these uh, kind of pains, longing to be free from this bondage to corruption and decay. Um, But as he continues, and this is where I want to focus um, here on these two two paragraphs, and kind of setting the stage for this broader concern with with suffering, is that he says here in... um, in verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And um, I think we saw kind of in a show of hands yesterday um, that way, and probably could do the same thing today with the three of us and probably most here, that we've all experienced things in life that make us groan that are hard, that make us long for the freedom from the corruption of this, of this world, that long for that. And the thing I, I find so refreshing in Scripture is that we're not turned aside from doing that, um, that God invites us to bring our cares before him, and that really is an act of faith, um, even as I heard yesterday with the expressions and the laments. Um, and there is a sure and grounded hope that we have, but God welcomes our hearts being poured out before him, Um, as we struggle with these things in life. Um, The very next paragraph uh, here, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And this statement here about the work of the Spirit, that even as we face suffering, God has provided us with the indwelling Spirit. That in those moments, and I I love the way that Paul expresses this um, here, that the Spirit helps us in our weakness as we struggle with the brokenness within this world and the hardships that we face. And Paul's discussion at this point is very broad in Romans 8. That in those instances where we can't find words to put to our prayer, it's not a matter here that Paul's saying that we don't know what to pray for, that we just need to have better instruction in prayer, that we need to learn some formulas or something like that. But it's really the what that we don't even know how to put into words the desires that are are on our heart as we agonize over the brokenness within this world and the pain that we're experiencing. And in those moments where we don't even know what to say, God's Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The one who searches hearts, the Father, knows perfectly 
the, what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit who indwells us intercedes on our behalf perfectly. And there is this um, here unbroken intercession before the Father that when we find life so hard in the things that we face, the Spirit meets us in that, um, in that weakness and is interceding perfectly according to the will of the Father on our behalf. And I find that very encouraging as we walk through different experiences. And there's a variety of things that are addressed in the New Testament. And um, in terms of, like, what is God doing in the midst of some of these kind of things? And how do we perceive some of these kind of things? But there's this under, you know, undercurrent throughout of God's care and his love for us. That regardless of what we face, um, he loves us. His spirit is present with us, interceding for us. And uh, Dr. Cronin, you have a couple of passages that you want to look at in terms of just some ways that, um, that God can work through the things that we face. Yeah, I guess I have two cognitive shifts that I'm proposing today when you think about suffering. You know, last night I was, I was talking to my wife and I was telling her that we were doing this panel discussion on suffering. And she says, well, how are you preparing to talk about suffering? I said, well, we've been married for 26 years. No, I did not, that did not happen. That conversation did not happen, Lisa. It didn't. No, but someone did ask me a few days ago, not my wife, how I was preparing for this. And, you know, in the last... 12 or 13 months, I've been diagnosed with a stress fracture in my foot, a torn ligament in my foot, a bulging disc, and then last week, a partially dislocated hip. So every step I take, I'm in pain. Uh, if you hear some groaning, that's not prayer requests, that is pain. And I'm, this afternoon, I'm going to get more treatment on my hip. Um, and so God has prepared me through 49 years of my life and a lot of physical pain that I've been through. And if you heard my sermon last semester on anxiety, that was 41 years of struggle there. I'm not going to dig into that today. But just to say, um, I've been preparing for 49 years for this message. I want to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. I think if you did a word study on the Greek word for all there, Mike, I think it still means all, right? I believe so. Yeah, yes. all. Yes. All. All means all. All comfort. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So my first cognitive shift that I'm proposing to you is to look at others. When you're going through suffering, it might not be about you at all. It might be about preparing you to minister to someone else who's in the midst of suffering. As I think about some of the, the struggles that I've been through, as I'm struggling with my, my hip right now, I had a conversation with someone this week who had a hip replacement a couple years ago, and I had a lot more empathy for him in the replacement surgery he went through now that I'm struggling with my hip. When I talk to people who struggle with anxiety, my heart breaks for them because of all the years that I have struggled with anxiety. The way that I approach it is completely different because I've been through it. And it, if it takes me suffering with something in order to be a better minister a year, two years, two decades from now to someone else, then I'll take it. Because I'm not here for me. I'm here to bring glory to God, to love him, and to love others. So when God pours out his comfort on me, that helps me then to pour my com that comfort out on other people when they're struggling. Verse 5, he says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. He goes on in verse 7 and says, Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. As I was studying verse 5, I was trying to figure out why Paul included that verse. And uh, I was reading some things about it, and some, some really helpful things came up. First of all, what Paul is doing in verse 5 is he's, he's, he's got a, a, a sheet with like two columns in it. In one column is the, su the sufferings of Christ versus the comfort through Christ. And when you minister to people today, there will be a surplus of suffering 
that comes that can almost be unbearable at times. Not always, but at times. But the consolation column also shows a surplus. And it more than balances from the first column of suffering. In the end, Paul's hope of our final deliverance melts the pain away. It's keeping one eye on the future, on what's going to happen. If we can keep one eye on our future glory that is to come, that helps us through our pain and suffering. And if we can keep part of us focused on the comfort we'll be able to give other people as we're going through affliction, then that will enable us to persevere in that affliction much better. The other passage I want to talk about is in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, he says in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What is wrong with this guy? That's called masochism. Hey, when you're going through hard things, consider it joy. That's pretty much the definition of a masochist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And with, then I, that led me down a trail of looking where that word came from. It's actually named after a guy. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a guy's last name, basically. Masoch. Yeah, he didn't like being attached to masochism. I, but, yeah. but that's okay. He didn't like it, so he's experiencing suffering, so it probably helped him out. I suppose. I don't know if that's yeah, one yeah. you want to be friends with that way. <laughs> probably not. That. Probably not. So I don't know how so, much that spills over. So, so how in the world can James say... When you're going through various trials, and James, is, I think he's pretty clear, he's not talking about a specific type of suffering, like persecution would be a specific type of suffering. He's talking about various trials, anything that you're going through that's hard and difficult, to consider it joy, to count it as joy. How can you do that? Verse 3, 4, or because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's how you can count it all joy. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Who wants to be lacking in nothing? Who wants to be perfect? Who wants to be complete? Who wants to go through suffering? Different answers for those questions, isn't there? I don't sign up for suffering. I don't have to. Many of us don't have to. It's going to come the way. Either we're entering some sort of trial we're in the eye of the storm, or we're exiting some sort of trial. That's the case it is for most of us. But we can only consider it joy when we realize what it can produce. Maturity. Steadfastness. Perseverance. Look, perseverance is the mark of a Christian. You want to know if someone's a Christian? Are they persevering in their faith? If they're not, there's reasons to question it. So do you want to be someone who perseveres? I do. And if suffering is the way to perseverance, bring it on. And I say that with a lot of fear and trepidation. But when I was coming back from the doctor's office, having been diagnosed with the torn ligament, the stress fracture in my foot, and then the bulging disc in my back, every step hurt, every breath hurt, everything I did was painful. Sleeping was painful. And I was walking into a Schuster building, and I was crying. I was weeping because I was in so much physical pain and I was frustrated. And then it hit me as I was, just as I was entering the building, luckily no one was there to see me that was by, but it hit me as I was walking in the building, if this is what it takes to continually refine me so that I persevere in the faith, bring it on. And I'm not saying I have a lot of those victories like that, but that day was a victory. That day, I was able to, to, to shift my perspective on the suffering I was going through. And if that's what it takes for me to be steadfast, persevere, lacking in nothing, complete and perfect, what would I not go through for that? What would I not go through for that? Because in that way, God gets glory. He gets glorified when I'm lacking in nothing. He gets glorified when I'm perfect and complete. When I am mature in the faith, he gets glory. And my, my desire in life is that he gets the glory. And a lot of times when suffering comes our way, we do anything we can to escape it. James doesn't say try to escape it. He says consider it joy because of what it will produce. Yeah, 
I think if I can ask you just a kind of a follow-up question with this. Um, you know, with experiences of suffering, we don't always know when they're going to come, nor do we always know how long they're going to last, or if, you know, there is going to be a specific, this is how God is going to use this in the life of someone else. Mm -hmm. So when we find ourselves not in those situations, what can we do to prepare that way? Um, like, so that as those things come, that we can be grounded and anchored and keeping the right perspective. Sure. So, unfortunately, I have to leave the New Testament. Is that allowed? I guess. You're going to go to the, going to the introduction of the, of the Bible? Is that? Yeah, the preface. Okay, okay yeah. good. All right. All right. Yeah. At least we know where you're at. Then. I mean, yesterday they made, mentioned Paul and Jesus, so I guess I can go to Job. And we never hear whether or not Job knew why he went through what he went through. We never heard. If he, if he ever discovered it. I'm not saying he didn't. I just say we don't know. Um, and rem reminding myself of Job and that we don't know if he ever was informed of why he went through what he went through. Um, it, it might be for myself to refine me. It might be to prepare me to minister to others. It might be for a totally other purpose. I just gave you two because I'm out of time. I only, that's why I only gave you two. There could have been more things we could have talked about. And I don't know what it is, and I don't really care. I just want to be prepared and equipped with the work that God has me to do. So I know that he's going to use it in some way, in some shape or form, and I trust in that. All right. Thank you. So we're going to look at another kind of specific example here. And Dr. Klaus is going to read, uh, lead us through um, a particular form of suffering that we may face um, here in looking at First uh, Peter in particular. So. Yeah, the, the New Testament, um, and actually the whole, all the scripture as we've been looking at, uh, gives us hope in every kind of suffering, right? That God can take difficulties we face and transform them um, for our purification and ultimately for his glory, as, as Dr. Croto um, just focused on. Um, but there are sections of the New Testament where the focus on suffering isn't just on the kinds of things that we face in our lives, the difficulties that come our way, but um, in fact, there's a, there's a number of places in the New Testament that talk specifically about persecution as Christian suffering. And um, just this little outline here isn't because I'm going to preach a sermon. Um, I just want to show you that the book of 1 Peter um, actually covers this quite extensively. It's, it's pretty much found in the entirety of the book. And one could say it is the theme of the book. And, um, and Peter just wants to give us kind of a handbook. What do you do when things get difficult for, difficult for you because you are a Christian? And so Peter defines suffering basically as, or Christian suffering as persecution, as times when you are doing the will of God. You are obeying the scriptures, and it brings you into conflict with the world system. And the world system reacts back. And that could be like, you're just not invited to a party, right? You don't kind of want you to be my friend anymore. But it might also be something like, you know, it can be violent persecution. We know in parts of the world, people suffer terribly for their faith. They're, ex, they're, uh, they're, they're kicked out of their families, and some even are put to death as martyrs. It, it can go that far, and um, uh, it can be very difficult. And so Peter wants us as Christians to know, okay, well, what do we do? How are we supposed to, to deal with this? And one thing he does is he kind of explains to us that suffering like this is really demonic, Right, he says in 5.8, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he's simply saying that one way Satan can get us to give up our faith is to put us in really difficult situations. But what Peter also tells us is that God stands over these circumstances, that, that Christ has defeated the evil spirits and anything that we go through is with God's permission. We don't, have to, we don't have to fear. We can trust that God is with us. But most importantly, Peter tells his readers that their sufferings or persecutions are not in vain, but they actually have a purpose. And some of the things he says overlaps quite a bit with the book of James or the book of Hebrews. But one thing Peter focuses on is that when we suffer for our faith, we are given the opportunity to share with Christ in his sufferings. Christ identifies with us by taking his, our sins on him, on the cross, but in our suffering for him, we get to share with him in those sufferings, 
with the hope that we will also have a future glory that we will share with him. One thing we learn in those sufferings that Peter focuses on is we learn how to respond to them. And guess who the model is of Christian suffering and persecution, right? It's our Lord Jesus in his own suffering. Peter says that, he, that when Jesus suffered, he continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. Jesus' suffering was the most unfair thing that ever happened in human history. And he bore it because he was trusting God in it. He knew God had a purpose and was able to endure it. And people, Peter says, Christ gives us an example so that we can follow in his steps. We can walk in his steps and how we endure it. And then there's one more thing in terms of purpose, and that is sometimes when we suffer persecution, and we suffer anyway, it, it actually serves to purify us. And there's this curious verse in, uh, in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, and he says, Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as the, to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but the will of God. When Christ suffered, he dealt with sin, and when we suffer, it's times where we are given an opportunity to overcome sin. So suffering is never without purpose, though it is, as we heard yesterday, uh, worship in a minor key. I love that. I love that expression. And so finally, how do we respond? And Peter gives us a couple things. First, because um, these things are difficult, um, he t um, to, to difficult, he gives us a perspective on what we are to do. And he, first of all, he says it shouldn't surprise us. If someone doesn't like you because you are living for God, don't be surprised, right? We know that's coming. If they didn't like the Lord Jesus, and they didn't like the disciples, they're not going to like those who, who, follow, who follow him and who are, are trying to live as a Christian. But instead, he tells us to rejoice, we already said, in light of future suffering, and then to entrust ourselves to God and keep on doing good. The challenge we face as Christians is not seeking persecution, right? Not being a jerk and drawing it on us, but at the same time, to not quit doing the things we should to avoid it, right? To continue to persevere. And then finally, the most curious thing Peter says is in a very famous passage, chapter 3, verse 15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Persecution gives an opportunity for witness. I guess my time is done. Time is done. <laughs> Christi uh, persecution gives an opportunity for witness. And that those are opportunities that God gives us to, if the opportunity presents itself, if the, if, the, if the chance presents itself, to share why it is that we can endure such things. So the question of suffering for our faith is not if, but when. And the New Testament, specifically books like First Peter, give us a guide in how we should approach it. And I think as we look at these different passages and different expressions, it becomes very clear as we look at the New Testament that we will face hardships in life. We're not exempt, and uh, there's a, a teaching known as the prosperity gospel that if you just have enough faith, God wants to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. And that is not biblical Christianity. Um, that is not the gospel. And the, the beauty that we see as we look at Scripture is a God who meets us in the midst of this that we may not at times understand what God is doing, but we can trust in the God who is present with us. We may face suffering as particular expressions of, um, of persecution or things that God may use in different ways that we may not know it at the time, uh, but God is with us in the midst of that. And we can use, as we look at scripture, passages like this to help shape our perspective. And I want to end with, with one final text. Um, and for those of you that know me, probably no surprise where I'm going here. Um, that's John's Apocalypse, so Book of Revelation. Um, and it's important to think um, here and to keep in view the end of the story as well, which I'm not sure if we really should call it the end of the story because it's really the full expression of the new creation that goes on for eternity. 
And uh, we find John saying uh, here at the end of, of, um, of this book, I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God and prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And as we look at this hope that we have, the state that we find ourselves in now, in living in the consequences of sin and the fall, that one day this will be no more. We will be in a new creation where these things are no longer present, where we will dwell face to face with our God. And I love the way that John describes this as, as he, he looks at this thing, that these things will pass away and we have this beautiful vision, which we could spend a lot of time unpacking, but I know we're right at the end of time right now. Um, but this beautiful vision um, of what um, we have to look forward to in dwelling with God in his presence. Um, but I love the expression that's here and drawn from some language here from Isaiah, but this expression here that God will wipe every tear from, um, from their eyes. And it's not as though as we look to the future that it's just a... Um, hear kind of pie in the sky, kind of hope kind of thing that way, but a God who in his compassion and his love for us has both prepared a destination far beyond what we are deserving of, but meets us in our pain. And um, I have this kind of image of, of um, as my kids um, here at various times were, whether experiencing physical injuries or other kinds of things that way, of as a father taking my hand and gently wiping the tears from their eyes, of God showing that kind of intimate love for us as his children and the comfort that he gives, um, as we've seen even over in, in um, expressions of that in 2 Corinthians. And there are, as we look at this, at this world now, there are a lot of hard things that we walk through. But as followers of, of, of Christ, there's also a lot of joy, a lot of things that give meaning and value to life, that as we look at the world around us that don't know Christ, that won't experience in the same sort of way. And there are moments in life of great joy that we look at and go, I don't know if I'm even deserving of experiencing joy like this. Um, there are also moments in pain where we experience a joy that is unexplainable in Christ as um, what he has done gives us great, um, great purpose and great value, even in the midst of hard times. And ultimately, as we look to the future, um, the hope that we have that God will bring to completion what he has promised. Um, and so hopefully those are some encouraging things as we think about as we experience um, these sorts of things in life. Because if we're not walking through them now, they will come. But God has given us great um, instruction and encouragement uh, here in his word for us. Um, tomorrow we're going to have some time uh, here to be praying for each other um, and praying together as a community. Um, as I mentioned, we're also going to hear from some of our counseling and psychology faculty to give us um, here's some practical wisdom of how do we walk through some of these kinds of things here um, in life. And hopefully, as we take a look at what Old Testament, New Testament says, that it is practical uh, that way. Um, but uh, you know, how do we think through some of these kind of issues and some opportunity for us to fellowship together as a community? 